God, praise God. Praise God. God has said some wonderful things to us in this conference. Things that we will carry with us and remember for many, many days to come. And our next speaker, he's no stranger to ARC. He is a part of the committee and has always been one that has had a voice that we have listened to. And uh, he has been a leader in this area. Uh, he has been an evangelist in all of our churches. He's been an apostle in our churches. He's been a prophet in our churches. And yet we still just call him Brother Morgan. Because I have something about him he doesn't change. I met Brother Morgan about 12 and a half years ago in a canoe. And uh, there was something going on that got me in his canoe. And we ran off and left everybody else in the middle of the river. And it was something that bonded us together. And he's one of my dearest friends. And I love him. He has blessed this apostolic movement. God is using Brother Morgan in a wonderful way in these last days to bless this apostolic movement with great words from heaven. He can open the word of the Lord like nobody I really know. Amen. And God used him in a wonderful way. How many of you excited about the word of the Lord you're about to hear as Brother Morgan comes to preach to us? Amen. We want to come take his liberty. Preach to us, Brother Morgan. Tyrone or Elizabeth Wren or Edwin or Iris Melendez, please call. It's important that you call Michael or Vanessa Tyson. The number is here. Brother Howard will have it for you in the booth display. Tyrone or Elizabeth Wren or Edwin or Iris, I believe it's Melendez. Amen. You have an important phone call. Amen. God bless you. Lord's good. Amen. Amen. We thank you for his blessings. Thank you for the spirit that we feel in this place. Amen. I believe the Lord has spoke very specifically and directly to all of us. And we are challenged not just to do greater things in the spirit or in progress, but challenged to look at ourselves and to take inventory. Amen. I trust that we all would feel like the Apostle Paul. I don't want to preach to others and then myself become a castaway. Praise God. I want to be saved, don't you? Praise God. And we're excited about these young evangelists. I think the church is all right. Amen. Thank God for the fire and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Anybody excited about what the Lord's doing in this hour? Praise God. Amen. I, uh, I really had planned on preaching something a little different this morning, and, uh, but uh, challenge you and strengthen you, and uh, we need to open our hearts not only to the word of the Lord, but to the touch of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Comes a point in time that, uh, and I hope you understand what I'm about to say, that we hear a lot of good preaching, and it builds to a moment, and then there is that moment when the Holy Ghost wants to walk in and affirm. Amen. I trust you'll do that this afternoon. Amen. Praise God. I'm glad we're still in a church that believes in a visitation of the Holy Ghost. Well, praise God. Maybe I need to say that again. I'm glad we're still in a church that believes in a visitation of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 I'll read to you from the book, first book of Timothy, chapter number one. I will read one verse of scripture, verse number 18. Amen. And I tell you, I got to watch him by the go there preach last night, and I thought, my Lord, he's 58 year old, and he hasn't slowed down one bit. Amen. He has given us a hard task of trying to keep up with these men going past Nebo. Amen. Praise God. Are you glad you're apostolic today? Amen. We give honor to Brother Howard. We appreciate and love Brother Gary Howard very, very much. Amen. Consider him to be our elder. And uh, he has been more than a friend. Amen. One of the things about Brother Howard you'll find out is if he loves you, he ain't afraid to tell you the truth. Amen. And I appreciate that in him and uh, his consideration and kindness to my family. Amen. I owe a great debt to Brother Howard and, of course, all the ministers that are here. I told Brother McLean he was... 
sharing a little stuff with me. And I said, I'd be glad to give you my time slot if you want to preach that today. Amen. And uh, I couldn't get him to do it. Praise God. First Timothy chapter number one, verse number 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Amen. I'll read it to you one more time. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Amen. I want to take an old title and put it to a new text today. Amen. I want to preach to you for the next few moments on the subject, <clears throat> faith's fight. Faith's fight. Amen. Praise God. I feel like the Lord is going to do a special work in this place this afternoon. Amen. I do not say this for any, any wrong motive or ego, but... Uh, <clears throat> I uh, was praying on a Sunday morning, and the Lord spoke very specifically to me about the services before Brother Howard had even called and asked me to come to her to preach. And uh, so I feel very definite about the will of God today. I feel very confident about the will of God. Not so worried about preaching today because I just feel like the Lord's going to touch a lot of people in this place right now. Amen. You got enough strength for one more service? Amen. Praise God. Why don't you clap your hands and lift your voice. Let's magnify the Lord together. <coughs> Praise God. I love you, Jesus. I glorify your precious name. Without words, without words. Without words. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Let's do it one more time. He's worthy of praise and adoration. Blessed. Blessed. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Amen. First and second Timothy, as you are very well aware is Paul's address to his son in the gospel, Timothy. It is a seasoned veteran minister writing and instructing a young man that is in his first pastorate. Amen. I thank God for men who are seasoned of experience that take enough consideration, enough time to help younger men. Amen. Somebody said amen. And a lot of what you read in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy is pastoral instructions to his son in the gospel and encouraging him and giving him admonition and instructions about the work of God and how he should conduct himself in this work. Amen. You must understand that there is a lot of things that we will miss sometimes if we are not aware of particular circumstances or surrounding circumstances or where a text has been set or placed. Amen. Paul has had tremendous results in Ephesus, but it was not easy to birth the church at Ephesus. You read where the Apostle Paul, speaking to his beloved Corinthians, made the statement, that I really would like to be with you, and it is my purpose to be with you. But I will tarry here at Ephesus until Pentecost, for there is before me a great effectual open door. But there are many adversaries. Amen. He had seen the potential of Ephesus. He knew that God wanted to do a specific work at Ephesus. He mentions later on that it was at Ephesus that he wrestled with the beast of Ephesus. Whether that speaks of demonic activity or the fact of men, which I believe if it's really demonic activity, it manifests itself through men. Amen. I, I see him as he struggles to see the work of God established at Ephesus. It was not an easy task to see it start. It was not easy to birth it at Ephesus. 
tremendous resistance and tremendous opposition. It was at Ephesus that it mentions its curious arts, its witchcraft, its sorceries. Ephesus was a city that was tremendously bound by occultism and Satanism and false worship and pagan concepts. But it was there that Paul said, I see the revival that is here, and I see the potential. It would be easy for me to come back to Corinth where it's already rolling and going, but I will stay here in Ephesus because I believe beyond these adversaries that there is a tremendous breakthrough in the Spirit. Somebody today just needs to make up your mind. It doesn't matter what has my city bound. God has sent me here and I'm not leaving. Well, I need a little help here this afternoon. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You're going to do the work of God. If you're going to do the will of God, you might as well get ready for it. Roll up your sleeves because the fight's starting the moment you decide to do the will of God. But I've come to tell somebody today that greater is he that's within you than he that is in the world. And if God be for us, if God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, praise God. Amen. <laughs> It was, in this, it was in this place that Paul calls for Timothy. He calls and asks him, and uh, per perhaps a little persuasion, but it is here that he begins to instruct Timothy that God has called you to this city. So Timothy steps into the church at Ephesus. It is not an easy task. Spirits never forgive, and spirits never forget. And there is no such thing as a permanent victory. You beat him today, you might as well get ready. He'll regroup and be back tomorrow trying to do the same thing before. Amen. Amen. It was here that, that Timothy found himself. Amen. It was here that Paul laid his hands upon him in the presbytery and began to prophesy and speak to him in concern to the work of God at Ephesus. It was confirmed by the Spirit of God and spoken by the man of God. Amen. But if you understand what takes place, and if you can really read between the lines, you will find out that something is beginning to happen to Timothy. Amen. We, write, we see in the writing of Paul in his first letter to Timothy, instructions and admonitions. But when you come to that second letter of Paul to Timothy, there is the mentioning in it that thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Paul began to note and to see that there was something happening to the mind and the spirit of Timothy. The spirits of Ephesus were beginning to bother him and to intimidate and to rule against him. The spirit of fear was beginning to move against Timothy. How would you like to pastor in the city where the temple to the great goddess Diana was? In a city where they were not afraid to chant in the court for hours of worship and praise unto their goddess. Amen. People had given themselves over to all sorts of false doctrine and false spirits and occultism. Amen. It was here in the shadow of the temple of the goddess Diana that Timothy was trying to keep the church going and trying to take territory for the kingdom of God. But as with all of us, there is a war and there is a battle that rages. It rages against our spirits and it rages against our minds. Amen. It will never cease. You might as well get ready for it. The Apostle Paul even told the church at Corinth. He said, I'm telling you, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And he goes to tell what that thorn was. There was a messenger sent from Satan to buffet me. He is continually pounding me. He is continually warring against me. But he said, I heard God say, my grace is sufficient for thee. So it doesn't matter how much Satan wars. It doesn't matter how much principalities rise. The bottom line is, when it comes to the church, that Jesus said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail because it is built upon the rock. Oh, praise God. Amen, amen, amen. It was here in this tremendous opposition that Paul in his first letter made the statement to Timothy. He said, I am going to give you a charge. I don't want you to ever forget this charge. I want you to remember it all the days of your life. This is not just good advice, he said. This is a charge. 
I charge thee, O son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Timothy, when the heat of the battle is on and the fire of persecution is burning, I don't want you to ever forget what God told you when he called you to this city. And when the devil starts warring against you, you just remember the prophecies. And when you start remembering what God said, he ought to stir you to good warfare. Oh, praise God. Amen. He writes to him in the second letter, and he begins it by saying such statements as this. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, he said, I am convinced, I am persuaded that it is in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Timothy, when you stand in the shadow of that temple and you see all that's in this city, when it's all overwhelming you, I want you to stir up that gift within you. I want you to start remembering what God said. And when fear tries to intimidate you, understand that's not what God gave you. That's not what God said. You need to make up your mind right now. This is not from God. God didn't give this to me. I was never meant to be intimidated, but God has given me power. And God has given me love. And I've got to develop a sound mind. Now, maybe it's different with you, but I, I don't think the devil is going to show up in your bedroom tonight <laughs> and uh, try to kill you or something. He might, but personally, I believe he's got bigger fish to fry. <laughs> but I will tell you what will happen. Where, where do you think the enemy speaks? Where is this war that goes on? Amen. It is a battle of the mind. It's a struggle against the mind. The thoughts that come. The bombardment of these thoughts. You can be in a good service on Sunday night, and you don't need hardly get out of the building and get in your car until all of a sudden, here comes hell warring against your mind trying to take the word that God had just spoke to you amen stay with me a second amen you can't even get pulled up in your driveway until he's already trying to question everything that God has just spoken and everything that God has just said He'll put it into your mind that he is so mean, so tough, so ugly, until you will, somebody's already said it here this morning, you will take your whole focus and attention off of what God has said, and you'll center it in on what he's saying, and what he's doing, and what he's breathing into your mind right now. That's why Paul said, not just love, and not just power, but a sound mind. And the word sound means discipline. He said, Timothy, if you're going to get the job done, you're going to have to learn how to discipline your mind. You have to learn how to take every thought to obedience and to captivity. You can't believe everything that comes creeping into your brain, son. That's the way the enemy is going to get you. He'll get you looking around and seeing all the circumstances. He'll get you seeing the temple. He'll get you seeing the false worship. He'll get you seeing reprobates. He'll get you seeing false brethren. He'll get you seeing the foreign 
fornication. He'll get you seeing the rebellion. And if you start thinking on that, you'll become fearful and intimidated. You've got to learn how to guard up your mind. You've got to learn how to discipline and say, no, sir, I will not let this take thought. I will remember. I will call to remembrance what God has said. Can anybody relate to what I'm talking about right now? He said, therefore, I put thee in remembrance. My God. I can see Timothy unrolling that scroll and starting to read down through there. And all of a sudden, it's a, it's a flashback. He can remember the service where his father in the gospel laid his hands on him. And now he's not hearing what Diana is saying or what false brethren are saying. But now all of a sudden, he's not hearing what some of the older folks in the church are saying about him being a young man. But now all of a sudden, he's remembering something. He can still feel the power of the Holy Ghost as it moved on him. He can still hear that old prophet talking in tongues as he's prophesying over him. He can still, I wish somebody would help me right now. He can still hear it right now. He can, he's beginning to remember. He's beginning to think about it. He's pushed all this other stuff out of his mind. And something now is welling up inside him. There's a fight coming back to him. He begins to recognize this is not my fight. This is God's fight. This is faith's fight. I didn't call myself here. God called me here. Somebody right now in this service, you need to take a trip back down the road. You need to remember the service. You need to remember the altar. You need to remember the sermon when God spoke it to you. And when you get to remember it, something ought to get a hold of you. I'm ready to fight, brother. Devil, you're not taking my promise. You're not taking my prophecy. You're not taking what God said. I'll fight you to the end. David and Goliath. I mean, I have preached that over and over and over and over. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And uh, I, uh, I got to see something the other day. You know, I, I have always admired David's tenacity and his strength. I've often wondered what it would be like to be a young man and taking some food to your elder brothers in the battle. And you got there. And uh, there's this nine and a half foot tall devil out there. And he ain't afraid of nothing. <laughs> and uh, so David says, now what's this? Is there not a cause now I'm going to tell you what separated David from his physical brethren and his national brethren was the fact that none of them really had a cause David had a cause to fight and I'm going to tell you why David could walk right into that valley with no fear or intimidation. He just picks up five stones, walks out there and says, you think you're bad, don't you? But I got news for you, brother. You can use all those swords and spears you want. But brother, when I stepped into this valley, the whole picture changed. Cause you see, all those men on that hillside, they don't have dripping on them right now. What I got dripping on me, because about four chapters before this, I had an old prophet call me in. And he looked at me and said, son, you're going to be the anointed of God. You're going to be the captain over God's inheritance. None of these other men have prophecy resting on them. But I got news for you, Goliath. It's the, I'm your worst nightmare. You would have wished you'd have never got up this morning. 
David knew, I know some of you won't agree with this, but David knew that Goliath could not kill him. He knew it. He said, buddy, on my worst day and your best day, you don't even have a long shot at it. Because I'm going to tell you why. It was prophesied to me that I'm going to be king. That I ain't got there yet. So David said, I've got something to fight for. i got a prophecy. And buddy, as far as I'm concerned, you're nothing but a stepping stone for me to get there. Some of you come to Ark 99 and all you can see is Goliath and Diana's temple and all your problems. What you need to remember is not your problem and not your opposition. You need to remember what God said. And if you're not there yet, you need to tell the devil, you cannot take me down. I'm on my way. He said, you uncircumcised Philistine. And what he said? Everybody else said the champion. And David said, you uncircumcised Philistine. Now in the New Testament, circumcision is baptism. And so what David was saying is, everybody else has been talking about how big you are and how big your buildings are and how big your crowds are. But to me, you are nothing more but somebody that hasn't even been baptized right And buddy, you've strutted your stuff all and you're going to strut them. Because while you were out here defying the armies of the living God, I was at home smelling anointing. God, was my hour coming? Not yet. And while you were out here telling everybody, I'm the biggest, I'm the best, and you can't take me down. God had me over here on the back side of a Judean hill, getting me ready for this very moment. You don't know my name. I've never preached a conference. I've never graced a camp many platforms. You don't even know my first name or my last name. But there's one thing you better understand. What I got here in the valley, I come with destiny written all over me. And as far as I'm concerned, you Trinitarian spirit, you've had your hour. I want to send a message to the spirit world today. That old false doctrine spirit that has loomed over us and challenged us and said, I will beat you, I will defeat you, not on your best day, honey. You can get the best preacher you got, fill up your coliseums, but you ain't seen nothing yet. David is on his way. I'm going to tell some of you something. All you folks getting excited about what the charismatics are doing. <coughs> and a bunch of our preachers, man, uh, they got the crowds. They got the people. They got the money. <laughs> I read the other day where one of their celebrities right now, if he comes to your church and preaches, he gets $10,000 of service. <laughs> that sounds pretty good to me. And I'm telling you, we get to look at that stuff, and you know, we get talking about it, seeing it, and wondering, my God, don't it bother you? you know, Brother, Brother Howard, 
I, uh, I like reading the Charisma magazines because all of our te- exes don't end up in Texas. <laughs> they end up on TBN. And uh, I, uh, I was reading this. I like to read it, just see the pictures and stuff, and 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 some of the baloney. It's advertising last month about the guy in Las Vegas doing magic tricks for Jesus. I said, God have mercy. And uh, but I, I got to reading down through there, and uh, it, it. I'm gonna tell you, it, it really made me mad. It really made me mad when I read it. Because I, I got to reading in there. Let me get a little closer to it. I got to reading in there. And uh, they are concentrating on every major city in North America now. And they are going to start in New York City. They have already secured Madison Square Garden. The estimated cost of this one evangelistic venture is 18.3 million dollars and they've already paid two million down to secure the building (laughs) now maybe that don't make you mad but that kind of messes with me because brother we get to the apostolics and start talking about money and they freeze up (laughs) I mean brother We're going to reach the world, but we want to do it on welfare. (laughs) Now that bothers me. But how that bothers me. I've been in apostolic services where preachers become beggars. Come on, folks. We got all this truth, all this gospel, all this stuff. And and when it comes to money, we have to start begging. I'm going to get $5 tonight. We need some money to cover the expenses of this meeting. Would you please? One venture. $18.3 million. Boy, it got quiet in here all of a sudden. Might as well get ready for it. It's fixing to be useless anyhow. Some of you don't know whether to say amen or own me right now. Brother McClain told me something the other day, and I said, man, I'm going to preach it so bad. He said, you know, really, Brother Morgan, he said, the apostolics have two gods. One's God and one's money. We're going to have to make up our minds which one was going to be our master. Well, I lost some of my shouters. Eighteen point three. That's more than the whole UPC snap budget. 18.3 18.3 just for one evangelistic endeavor, just to bring the laughing spirit to New York City. <laughs> holy laughter is coming to New York City, and it's going to cost them $18.3 million to bring holy laughter. Well, I can tell you what, we could do it for a whole lot less and bring the Holy Ghost instead of holy laughter. Now, now, just stay with me here a second. Just stay with me a second. Now, you see, you, you can get you get to looking out in that valley and see Goliath standing out there, and he's saying, "Well, what well, you want, God? Folks, send somebody out here to fight. You folks say you got all this truth and all this stuff. Come on out here and we'll just take to it." Boy, everybody's like, "Oh my God, man, how can we ever match that kind of stuff?" But just, just, just hear me. Just hear me. Somewhere along the way, you're going to have to get a revelation. It doesn't matter how big they are. It matters how big your God is. And it matters what God has said. Now, I know some of you, I know, I know, and I'm fixing to get in all kinds of trouble right here. I understand that. It's not the first time. Now, I know some of you want your little four and no more. Come on. Come on, preach. And I know that you, you think all that revival stuff, that's just a bunch of junk. 
Well, I'm just glad you're not God. Because, Brother Sat, well, I've had God tell me some stuff. And I'm telling you, when he said it, I was like, oh, my God. Nobody would believe it if I told them. Now, now maybe you haven't had this happen. But the moment he says it, I've learned, better brace up. Better get ready. Because from the time it's spoken to the time it's fulfilled is one big fight. I do not believe that when God closes the age of the Gentiles that we're going to be holding the fort. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Gates are stationary. They don't move. We're not sitting here bracing up for hell to come marching against us. I just started meddling now. I'm messing with some of you. Uh -uh. Gates are stationary. They don't move. That's talking about the wisdom of hell. I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now that the church was never destined to be sitting over here braced up for some spiritual attack. The church was destined to be in forward motion and movement constantly, perpetually moving forward, 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 forward. There is no neutral territory. There is no place where you can just stand still. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. And the thing that will cause you to move backwards is when you start thinking about all this Goliath stuff and all this intimidating junk and everybody that's went crazy and wacko and went up to Waco. Yeah. All, the, all the folks that sold out and all this stuff. I don't care how many of them sold out. I don't care how many of them get in their pulpit and compromise. The bottom line is, is God made a prophecy to the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I agree with what Brother Paget said yesterday. We can spend all of our time focusing on the enemy and what he's doing until we just get braced up. Oh, here it comes again. Dear God, I'm so sick of that. Somebody needs to get a wild Holy Ghost spirit on them that says, I ain't sitting still. I'm not dying here. I don't care how many temples dying has got in the city. I don't care how many Trinitarian churches there are here. I don't care how big their building is. The difference is I've got prophecy resting on me. Something is on me. Uh, I come to settle a score today. <laughs> now, I'll tell you something. The wise man in the book of Ecclesiastes says, to everything there is a season. Now, I'm going to try to explain this the way I see it. Now, God, who dwells in eternity, somebody said, uh, he is the great God that was impossible. He is the great I am. He dwells in eternity. There is no was or is to come with God. Somebody said, well, the angels cry holy. That's talking about the physical manifestation. That's talking about that which is in time. But God's in eternity. And in God's foreknowledge, there are things that God has set from eternity. Purposes and things These purposes and these things have a season. I hope you stay with me a second. It is set. It is done. In eternity, it is established. Now, the wise men said, for everything there, noting position there, is the season. So for everything that God's going to do, it has a season. Now, I was born in southeast Missouri. 
And uh, I've never seen people picking cotton in February. <laughs> because God is the one that instituted and set seasons. It's a season to plant. And he goes to wise men, goes on through there. There's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to laugh, a time to mourn. He goes all the way through there. And when he gets down in there, he says, there is a seat. There's, for everything, there is a season. Now, the business of the devil is to keep you from being there when the thing is in season. But you know what? Seasons come and seasons go. I feel like I'm losing you for some reason here. And the devil knows enough about the way God works. If I can just keep you preoccupied until the season passes, you're going to miss what God wanted to do. And so it's his business to try to get into your mind and to get you so, that's what Paul said. He said, no man of war entangleth himself. He, the entanglement was his mind. He, he get all this stuff where you just totally push out the thing that God said he was going to do. And you just get so sidetracked with life and problems and situations to where you don't even hardly ponder or meditate or think on what God said. And if the devil can keep you all preoccupied, he says, if I can just keep them going a little while longer, their season will pass. Or they'll get in maybe just for a little late harvest and they won't get the full harvest. And so I'll tell you what he does. He causes saints to do stupid stuff. He causes preachers to talk about you. Talk about other preachers. He talks about he gets in your brain and creates all this stuff and fussing and fighting and feuding and well I'm losing some of you right now it's a sinking ship he gets you so preoccupied now, now I'm, I'm really going to get in trouble for what I say right here I'm going to get in big time trouble all you folks worried about the church I'm, I'm not worried about the church now, I may be worried about some of the folks claiming to be in the church. But I am not worried about the church. Well, that went over real good, didn't it? We spent all of our time talking about all the problems and all the situations and all this stuff until where you take your total focus off of what God called you to do and the purpose that God gave you to do until where you spend all of your energy and all of your time over here somewhere. And the devil just keeps flowing it up over here, keeps it moving over here. So all your attention is focused over here. And while all this is going over here, time is passing. Tick, 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 tick. And the season's passing. And the, and the thing that God wanted to do in that season is slowly but surely on the vine to get into wither. Somebody better call to remembrance today what God calls you to do. <laughs> Jesus, my God. We have got to be there in the right season doing the right thing. There's something I don't like to think about. And the more he talked, the better I got. And when I start biting on this side of my lip, I'm mad. And my wife see me biting on my lip and she's kicking me on the table. But it was too late. I turn up and say, sir, there's some things I find funny in life. But what you're doing right now is not the least bit funny to me. I'm sorry that some of you are so carnal you couldn't hear God if he thundered. Get turn some of that junk off you watch and look at. God might have a little time to talk to you. I refuse to let a bunch of carnal dingbat dictate to us that God cannot speak. If we're going to be led in the Spirit, somebody better learn how to hear the voice of God. 
If the supernatural scares you, what are you doing in the church? The church is the greatest force of the supernatural power there is. We're not intimidated by this stuff. We're not intimidated by their carnality. It's time for the church to rise and say, we got something riding on us. God called us for this hour. God put us in this season. This is our hour. Now I want you to hear what I'm going to tell you. About two years ago, over the other auditorium, on Friday night, the Spirit promised to move to that building. It was probably the hottest service I've ever been in in my life. And Brother Howard, it was so strong in the building you could cut it with a knife. Friday night. Anybody remember? Anybody there? And the evangelist whirls around and says, I'm going to prophesy. And he started saying stuff about churches in Oklahoma running 2,000. Now, you know what we got the ability to do? When we're in that spirit, that environment, and the Holy Ghost is the witness of it, we believe it. But after we leave the service, and a few of our friends start telling us, better be careful. Better watch out. Don't get you in trouble. Probably not even a man of God. Brother Howard, from that moment to right now, all hell has broke loose in this area. Oh yeah. It's hit full force. And the devil is doing everything he can to get us sidetracked and distracted. And some of you haven't even remembered the prophecy for months until I just spoke it to you right then. If I remember right, he turned on some of us pastors to begin to, and boy, we were going, Whoa. I don't believe in all that prophecy stuff. Well, it's time for you to leave the building. Fight, preachers going crazy. Did everyone get hit? I just want to ask you a question. Did God say it or not? Now, if he didn't say it, there's a whole bunch of us in here, some of the biggest hypocrites I've ever seen. Because we sure acted like we believed it on Friday night. But what happened is, is we let our minds get filled with everything else. And we forget the prophecy. And then it's easy to say, false prophecy. False prophecy. Listen, it's time to pick apples. And you sit in the living room with your feet propped up. And the season passes and winter sets in. And you finally get up and go out there to get apples and say, well, there ain't no apples out here. Don't come back and tell me there's no such thing as apples. Just because you're too lazy to get up and go get it, don't come tell me somebody missed it. Just because you got occupied, I'm going to preach against that spirit until it breaks wide open here this afternoon. Some of you right now need to start clearing your mind out. You need to get all the clutter out of your mind. You need to get all the distractions out of your mind. You need to remember what God said. Yeah, but the devil's attacked. It doesn't matter if he's attacked. That's what he was created to do. It's to try to keep you from being there. But you've got to make up your mind. I'm going to be there when the season's on, and I'm going to enjoy the thing that God said he's going to do. I want to say it loud and clear. The age of the Gentiles is just about over. 
And if you ever thought about having revival, you better have it right now. We don't have another 50 years to sit around and talk about it. It's time for every red hot apostolic to make up your mind. There ain't nothing keeping me out of there. I'm on my way. I'm not stopping for nothing or no part. I'm going to give some of you one of the greatest and most profound revelations you've ever heard. <laughs> I bring this little simple message called How to Get From Here to There. It is so, so cool. I don't feel like it's going to be. They didn't have to sit down. I don't care. I'm telling you, you, you got to have a real high IQ to come here. It won't be a good blood. It's time for this woman, the man of your bear, all right. And one thing in common, they all talk this for circumstances, some insult, some prejudice, whatever. But they all have one thing in common. They got from where they were at to where they need to be. And they have one common denominator. Can we tell you how to get from here to there? Are you ready for it? No, some of you aren't ready. No, you're not. This, this, this. Is that well? Are you ready? Thank you. See? Okay. Here it is. You've got to want to be there more than you want to be here. Ain't that deep? That's really profound, isn't it? Well, I'd be there, but oh, there ain't no excuses to it. You're, you're staying where you're at because you want to be there. Honey, it don't matter if you got to bust through the roof, touch the hem of his garment, have him call your dog, whatever. When you make up your mind, he said it, then I'm going to be there. No, the devil's not fighting. Like you're the only one fighting devil. You just knew the city I passed it in. You just knew what my people were like. You just knew the town I was in. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask something. 